of innovation in glaucoma. We have a star of uh, speakers today, a huge galaxy of stars uh, here, and then I'm sure this uh, session is going to be very informative, and uh, uh, we look or learn about things which we can look toward in present as well as future, the new things that are going on in the horizon of glaucoma. I request uh, 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 the uh, Dr. Rajendra Bansal is the chairperson, then I request uh, uh, the, all the speakers and uh, conveners to please uh, come on the podium. We'll start, okay. Um, So can I start by inviting the first speaker of uh, today, Dr. G. Chandrasekhar. Uh, Dr. G. C., uh, he is uh, known to everyone, very, very well known as G. C. Uh, he is uh, the, right now the vice chair of uh, L. V. Prasad Institute and uh, pioneer and uh, very well established innovator in glaucoma. His topic is fundus imaging in glaucoma diagnosis. Sir. Thank you, Sirish. So at the innovation center that we have recently started at LB Prasad Institute, we were toying with the idea of uh, developing an indirect ophthalmoscope, low cost, that can be used as a fundus camera, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. So they, they call it as, we call it as an open source uh, indirect ophthalmoscope. That's why it is uh, abbreviated as OIO, and because the OIO the, at the right corner looks like that. They, they put a mnemonic as OWL as one of the other names for this. So an open source, low cost, portable fundus camera is what uh, the idea is. And it should be able to help in the detection of diabetic retinopathy as well as glaucoma. So this is the kind of assembly that uh, we have put together. There is a 20 diopter lens. You can have one or two lenses if you don't want to shift between the right eye and left eye. If you keep only one lens, there is a mechanical switcher with a battery power power that can be used to shift from the eye to the other eye. And there is a sensor and a camera and an LED screen on which the image will come. And that's the essential, uh, this thing. And this is from the prototype, an image that was taken where there was some kind of a reflex that was photoshopped and this is the kind of image that you can get with this kind of a thing. Obviously, we keep showing the best case scenarios. We are learning how to get that kind of an image consistently. And some kind of, kind of safety calculations have been done and seems to be compatible. With the collaborating with the MIT Media Lab, what we are trying to do is machine learning algorithms to, pre to predict severity of diabetic retinopathy. So this is the initial analysis where on a scale of 1 to 4, the estimated severity is 0.6. And with all these hemorrhages and exudates, the estimated severity here is 3.26 on a scale of once again 1 to 4. This is just a brief comparison of the cost and the weight and other parameters of the existing uh, fundus cameras with what we are trying to develop. The thought is that we should be able to build it within 30,000 rupees as a cost, and it weighs about one kg compared to the weight of the other fundus cameras. And based on what all you put into this, you can directly connect it to a cloud or a laptop to store your images and whatever kind of analysis that needs to be done subsequently on those images, either remotely or on the site. The, the way forward is we see is to build a standard prototype for commercialization and probably work on developing a non-mediatic device. At this point of time, it's a mediatic device and incorporate software for glaucoma detection. And what are we, which way are we going towards that is what I'll address subsequently. So what we had done about three, four years ago is to start this study, which we called as LB Prasad Institute, Glaucoma Epidemiology and Molecular Genetics, LBPA Gleam Study. The idea here was that in one particular village where we have one of our vision centers, we had kind of set up a lab where population from the nearby villages were screened above 40 years and brought to that place, and a full detailed workup was done. We have screened about 3,833 patients with a detailed workup was done for them. And the, the, the sequence of workup was that the history, lensometry, visual acuity, retinoscopy, subjective refraction, IOP, direct ophthalmoscopy, and gonioscopy. We tried to see whether a vision technician can be trained to do a gonioscopy. It was done by vision technician 1. And the vision technician 2 would take a fundus picture, non mediatic FDP screening, non mediatic fundus photograph, anti-segment imaging with a slit lamp photos, 
and Humphrey Visual Field. And then an optometrist with, which, with whom we had done some agreement would recheck the gonioscopy, dilate the fundus, do a clinical examination, do a posterior segment OCT and stereo disc photographs. So collecting all these data, what is the kind of permutations and combinations, both technology and human resource that you can put together to diagnose glaucoma in the community was the idea. The methodology of the study has been published. And we also published our agreement with the two staff optometrists who were there at the site managing the thing as far as gonioscopy as well as fundus examination was concerned. So this is the best case non-mediatics fundus camera and this is the worst case non-mediatics fundus camera images that we had. The idea is if you have to have only a vision technician, how can you take it forward without dilating the pupils? The, the important thing that we are looking at is that if you have the stereo photographs and we know that the all the disc parameters, whether it is cup disc ratio or a neuroretinal rim area, which is more important, is dependent on the disc size. Can we have a robust normative database based on which we can probably categorize the images subsequently? So one of the optometrists is pursuing his PhD. What he has done is that we had about 1600 optic disc photographs where the visual fields were completely normal, reliable and normal. Only those disc photographs were taken. On those disc photographs, using a planimetry, he has measured the cup disc ratios and the neuroretinal rim area and, de and has developed a MATLAB program <coughs> with which you can automatically measure the different areas once you mark out the disc margin and the cup margin. So this is not on the disc, but this is on the OCT based disc and cup disc, cup disc ratio versus disc area. So if you have this kind of a large database, how can you then take an, take an image, put it through a software algorithm and see whichever segment of neuroretinal rim that you are looking at, whether it falls within the normative range or outside the normative range as is done by the Moorefield regression classification. That's the objective. The images have been graded. They are being worked to see how to develop the software and how it can be incorporated with this fundus camera. So in uh, summary, with this uh, open source indirect ophthalmoscope with a machine learning algorithm for diabetes that is already in place and for glaucoma, what is the best way to do that? based on the population-based study that we have done, is what we are working on. Thank you. We could have the discussion at the end of the session. We have uh, time uh, which is allocated for that. Uh, Madam Dr. Ramanjit Siota, can I uh, invite you? Dr. Ramanjit, uh, uh, she is a leading uh, glaucoma research facility and uh, clinical service at RP Center. Uh, we all have handouts which have the brief CV. I'm not going into that. Uh, she, uh, Dr. Amanjit is uh, going to talk to us on uh, blip sparing epithelial exchange for dysfunctional blips. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I was asked by Dr. Siri to talk about innovations, and I think he was rather shocked when I said I'd talk about uh, blip revisions. But I think the reason uh, for doing this is that you know, regardless of who we are, if we are over 40 and we happen to need a trabeculectomy, especially a trabeculectomy with mitomycin C, we would love to see these photographs, you know, in the middle at the end of maybe two, three, four years. But unfortunately, what we do find is that there are going to be some which are going to be fibrosed and not functioning. There are going to be the others who are going to have either a very thin wall or a very sweaty blib. Till about three or four years ago, we were very, very reluctant to do anything about these because the chances of, of having a, a rise in intraocular pressure was very significant. So when we look at bleb histologies, what we find is that the use of mitomycin actually leads to a, a thinner and more irregular uh, epithelium on the whole. And when we looked at those eyes specifically that had hypotony and, and sweating blebs, again, it was the same thing. We found that the basement membrane was thickened and the overlying the epithelium was thin and keratinized. So it then sort of occurred to us that we shouldn't actually do a very extensive surgery. All we need to do is probably replace the epithelium. What we did find was that the dose and duration of application of mitomycin resulted, I think, in more often uh, um, blebs that looked like that, generally three to six years after surgery, more often in younger patients, and I'm happy to see younger was less than 55 years. So just to explain the basis of this surgery, all you need to do is to actually mark out the edges of, of any kind of uh, dysfunctional bleb you have, and then you can just lift the epithelium off and peel it. So basically all you remove is this tissue, and then you sort of advance the conjunctiva forward, and just to go forward, and I'm hoping that this works. 
is that, again, for lack of time, I'm just going to sort of take you forward. So you're just outlining the area of the blip. Once you've outlined it, what you need to take is only the conjunctiva, nothing else, no tenons, nothing else. You're just taking conjunctiva from around. And what you're then trying to do is to hold the edge of the, the outlined area. And as you can see, this area is, is over the area of the bleb. The epithelium is just peeling off. You're just cutting the, the posterior edge and the rest of the epithelium is peeling off. And subsequently, all you need to do is to make sure that you've actually replaced that area and uh, made it completely watertight so that your bleb begins to function immediately. So as far as the results are concerned, this is a, a, a bleb that is seen in, uh, sort of the second or third post-op day. This is two years down the line. And you can see that most patients seem to have really low intraocular pressures. And what we did find was that on an ASOCT, this is a patient preoperatively, you can see the real thinning that you could see over there, and this is the scleral ostium. But you can see that then nothing happens to the bleb itself. The bleb is exactly what it was preoperatively. The only thing that has happened is that the epithelium has been changed. So what we found was that 90% of them had achieved their target IOP without medication, as compared to a, a, another study which actually excised the blebs and put a free graft where the success was probably much less. And in a further study that has been done from the US where they used amniotic membranes, again, you can see the absolute success is much lower. So we did get pressures that range between 12 and 13. And the only thing that happened was that the bleb height decreased and the vascularity increased slightly. So these are, again, photographs pre-op and two years post-op. And you can see that the patients are absolutely off medications and their fields are controlled. So just to reiterate that there are many ways in which you can do a bleb revision. Uh, there have been a number of other studies using conjunctival advancement alone. But when you, uh, a lot of these other studies actually scraped the epithelium off the bleb, probably injuring the bleb as well. While this method of just peeling the conjunctival epithelium leaves the entire bleb functioning as well as it did otherwise. So just to conclude, I think peeling and replacing the conjunctiva is a safe technique. It's actually very effective. The bleb is flatter and a little, with a little thicker epithelium and it maintains bleb function and target IOP in over 90% of patients. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I think each of the lectures is so unique and different. We have a lot to learn from uh, all the lectures in uh, isolation. I request uh, Dr. S.S. S. Pandav um, to talk on a novel, novel approach to measure the bleb function. Uh, sir is a professor of ophthalmology at Advanta AI Center um, in uh, Chandigarh. Sir. Uh, thank you, Sesh, for uh, including me into the program. I think you have all seen these different kind of blebs when you treating surgery, and <clears throat> sometimes they behave well, and sometimes they are quite horrific. Uh, as a clinician, we all know this. But the important thing about the glaucoma surgery is that the blebs are the hallmark of uh, glaucoma surgery, uh, both the, the trabeculectomy as well as the tubes. So. Uh, other thing is, uh, there's no standard blebs actually. You, you can't really standardize a bleb because the response in every uh, individual is different, and that's more uh, true for trabeculectomy. Practically, it's impossible to control uh, bleb morphology, size, shape, elevation, extent, thickness, vascularity. Uh, this is possible to some extent in the tube implants where you have a predefined area and, and the location, but still, uh, there are a lot of uh, variables there. Now, we know the IOP control depends on the functioning of the bleb, uh, and that means the function, what the function of the bleb basically means is the ability of the bleb to conduct fluid through its wall, which can also be called as a porosity of the bleb, and also to distribute this fluid into the you know, surrounding conjunctiva for a larger you know, area where the fluid can uh, get back into the circulation. The question is, how do we measure the bleb functions? Now, clinically, in human beings, it's the, uh, the IOP is a good surrogate measure. So when we say, you know, after trabeculectomy, if trabeculectomy or uh, implant surgery, if the IOP is controlled, uh, we can't assume the bleb is functioning well, and if it's not controlled, it's, it's not functioning well. 
But this doesn't hold true when you are doing an experimental setting because it's very important to understand. If you want to understand you know, the, how, what goes inside the lab, we have to resort to experimental uh, work. And there, this study doesn't work. That's because the normal trivial mesh work is already there unless you are you know, handling a glaucoma model specifically. But for most of the animals, uh, if you're not doing a glaucoma model, then uh, because the normal trivial mesh work, which is also functioning, is very hard to say what part, percentage or portion of of acquisition going through the trivial mesh work and what is going through your lab. So I think to keep that lacuna in mind, we, uh, we kind of had designed a new well. So this was an uh, AutoCAD uh, designing of a uh, implant, which is somewhat resembles Moderno implant and are of the similar dimensions as well. As the only thing is that we put two tubes so that we have an extra handle to investigate what's going on inside the lab. So this one of the tubes could go into the interior chamber uh, and the other could remain outside or the both could remain outside and uh, we could see what happens uh, in that area. So this implant was uh, 3D printed actually and then refined and after sterilization was uh, implanted in the number of uh, rabbit eyes, uh, eyes to see how it uh, behaves. So uh, you can see there's a rabbit eye already implanted and in this uh, particular experiment we have two tubes which are lying side by side. One is blocked and the other is, uh, is being investigated. This uh, is being investigated through the second second tube, and this is the kind of experimental setup we have. So how do we measure capsule porosity, basically? The idea here is to measure the capsule porosity, the how much functional a blab is. And this we typically did, say, at different time intervals. Uh, so what we had was, uh, this is kind of a schematic diagram. So you have a pump syringe system, which could uh, pump a known amount of fluid in microliters you know, per second uh, into the system. And also, this is pressure gated, so that you could also know that how much is the pressure in the system. So you can investigate, OK, at 10 millimeters of mercury pressure, how much fluid is going into that lab or through that lab uh, in one minute. And so that gives us a lot of information about the function uh, of the lab. So what happened was that when we did, uh, you know, initially, what, we, what happened, we plant, implanted the blab in rabbits. And if you look at uh, the four weeks, the, IOP, uh, the, the implant was not connected to the anterior chamber. And it was just the capsule around the anterior chamber. And once we tested for porosity, the blab was found to be quite porous. But if you connect it with the anterior chamber, when the aqueous is flowing within four weeks, the porosity actually drops to almost 80%. And this is also kind of a no. So this is a, uh, and this was the initial model that we had published in IOVS in 2013. And subsequently, we have refined this model. And uh, uh, in this model also suggests, you know, like the, when the IOP, uh, when the porosity goes down, the IOP goes up. And here, the, the, the capsule also becomes sick. So these things are correlate what we normally see clinically and what we clinically believe, because we know that in four to six weeks' times, there is a hypertensive phase in most of the tubes, and uh, especially AGV. And then you have the thick uh, capsule formation, and the pressure goes up. Uh, so the question is here is that we believe some of we, we say that is the echoes actually, which is some way responsible for you know the failure of the blab and. Uh, uh, the thought is that there are several, uh, you know, active substances in the aqueous, and they, they might be causing uh, this uh, decrease in porosity. So we wanted to investigate a little further, and we, uh, ex ex uh, you know, ex uh, uh, implanted these experimental GDGs in another 17 rabbit eyes. And uh, but here, what we did was that instead of passing, you know, aqueous, uh, we actually passed BS, as just just a normal physiological fluid, uh, through the implant uh, for about 45 minutes at in a certain intervals, like seven days or 45, uh, 30 days after the, the initial implant is, implantation was done. And what we found that in, after one month, uh, when we passed the aqueous, uh, you, know, you know, through that uh, um, implant at physiological pressures, at 12 millimeters of mercury pressure, the porosity still dropped by 80 percent, uh, you know, irrespective. Uh, you know, in that. So if you can look at, again, there's a very marked reduction in porosity. In fact, it, even after the one uh, flow of, uh, you know, one uh, cycle of uh, fluid passage, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, porosity of the capsule drops. Now, this is kind of independent of the aqueous. So that makes us think uh, whether the aqueous, uh, you know, is, uh, is the only thing responsible, because the BSS is also showing a, caps you know, a, ch a similar change in the capsule porosity. And what is another thing significant is that during this period, uh, there was no, mu not much change in the thickness of the, the capsule. So it basically highlights two things. Uh, one is that the, it's not just the aqueous. Aqueous uh, 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 cytokines may be pl playing a role, but probably they are not the only thing. And there are other factors which are responsible for reduction in porosity. And also, 
the thickness of the capsule that, that we see that may not be a primary event. It Maybe uh, it is secondary to high IOP or the blood has already failed. So that means uh, after you have challenged the fluid capsule with the fluid, the porosity has gone down, and subsequently you see the secondary changes in the echo scan happen. And this data has also been published last year. To summarize, the understanding functioning of a blood is important, and uh, also important to understand the glaucoma filtering surgery. So this model we developed to basically to investigate the blood function in terms of you know, capsule porosity in experimental setting. And this is kind of helping us to investigate and, you know, what happens, uh, why the blabs fail, and hopefully we'll have some you know, better devices in future. Thank you very much. Yeah. <coughs> Thank and, you, Bhattu, uh, This sir. data was, uh, sorry. Can you, the sum, can you put the last slide? So there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of people working on this group. So, the, uh, so this part of this work was done at our center, and part was done in Australia at uh, um, Center for Eye Research Australia, where I have Michael Coote and Jonathan Croston as uh, co-investigators. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pandav, sir. We'll be having the discussions at the end of the uh, session. Uh, first of all, I thank all the speakers to strictly adhering to the time. This really saves us with a lot of uh, plenty of time for discussion. Uh, I request uh, Ramakrishnan, sir, S. Ramakrishnan. He is a CMO of Tirunelveli Arvindai Hospital. Uh, he is stepping into shoes of uh, Dr. George uh, Puturan, who could not join us uh, uh, today due to personal reasons. Uh, uh, Ramakrishnan, sir, is going to talk about reverse engineering and uh, glaucoma drainage implant. Like, what is the thing that went in behind the development of the Adi implant. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sreesh. And uh, uh, of course, my role is very much limited uh, in this uh, uh, innovation. I just uh, coordinating and uh, advising the uh, clinical as well as the biomedical engineering uh, from our lab. Uh, of course, the management of uh, intractable glaucoma is one of the challenging problems in the field of uh, ophthalmology. We have, of course, uh, one of the best options is uh, to uh, uh, glaucoma drainage uh, implant uh, device, which has become more popular for the past two decades. But one of the disadvantages, especially in countries like us, the cost factor, which is very, very uh, expensive and uh, common man cannot uh, afford to have that. That's why we at Aravindi Hospital, with the help of uh, biomedical engineering of our lab, uh, thought of uh, manufacturing a cost-effective uh, um, a drainage implant in care to uh, do it in an uh, intractable case of uh, uh, glaucoma. So the reverse or back engineering is nothing but the, the process of extracting the knowledge or uh, design information uh, from anything uh, man-made or reproducing it uh, or reproducing anything based on the extracted information. The reason why this is uh, uh, done or why it's important is see, Suppose the original manufacturer of a product is no longer produce a product, or there is any if there is any inadequate documentation of the original design, or uh, if the original uh, manufacturer no longer exists, but your customer needs the product, or to explore the new avenues to improve the product performance and the other features of the product, and of course other thing is the original supplier is unable to, or unwilling to provide the uh, this one, and also. Uh, of course, the original, uh, the prototype of this uh, barrel is was not uh, marketed in uh, uh, Europe and uh, uh, South America initially, but uh, now they have only patented in uh, U.S. as well as in Europe and not in India and other African countries. We thought of the possibility of uh, uh, developing implants with so many other models like Maltino or uh, uh, Agamed and uh, barrels, but we thought since uh, barrel is uh, commonly used by most of the glaucoma surgeons, we thought this will be the best uh, product to uh, manufacture in our uh, lab setup. And of course, we did uh, the benchmarking with the uh, uh, this uh, uh, barrels. And I, at this juncture, I have to thank uh, Dr. Paul Palmer from the, uh, Baskin Palmer and uh, uh, Alan Robin from uh, John Hopkins, who was instrumental in. Uh, 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 coming up with uh, this type of RD implant from our lab. And we selected the 350 square meter uh, uh, RD implant, and almost the uh, structure and the uh, function is almost similar to the type of uh, Barrel's implant. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the price cost factor is also again another. Uh, now we are able to give it to less than $50, and uh, I'm happy that. Uh, most of the leading institute in India and other countries have started using uh, 
is already in plant. And uh, keeping in mind that, you know, the, uh, we at the R lab, the biomedical engineer, they did a very vigorous exercise uh, to uh, produce uh, this product and especially the selection of the material. The physical property analysis was carefully done and the plate uh, dimension and other profile and two measurements and uh, with the computed uh, 3D virtual model was uh, made. And of course, the other material property, that uh, mainly the silicon, it's almost we have uh, 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 selected so many uh, grades of uh, silicon, but this is the one best uh, silicon except for the, the barium impregnated. The original barrel is barium impregnated and it is uh, radio opaque, but here we didn't have that property, it's radio lucent. And also we have done uh, the other studies like uh, because the plate flexibility is uh, in almost equal to that of. Um, bare wells and also the tube also almost like that of uh, uh, bare wells. So the main uh, the thing is the, there are two methods of uh, uh, producing this uh, plate, this uh, uh, implant plate. One you can do a compression molding process using uh, by, R, by liquid silicon, uh, uh, this one. But in our uh, uh, implant we uh, uh, Sorry. We uh, many mainly we uh, we did with this uh, implant with the uh, compression molding process. This is a very uh, very difficult uh, process because making this compression this mold is very uh, 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 important because our biomedical engineer they have worked with their company in Germany and uh, with a lot of uh, difficulty they were able to uh, do this uh, compression mold. And uh, it may look very simple, but uh, once you uh, introduce the silicon plate to the compressor, and it will definitely, uh, actually, the, when it, uh, uh, the end product will be almost like a, a, a liquid uh, silicon rubber molding uh, pro, uh, process. And uh, it has got uh, three holes on its uh, surface, similar to that of uh, uh, bare wells implant. And uh, another important thing is the, the incorporation of the silicon tube into the uh, this uh, uh, implant plate. So same uh, dimension and the same uh, that uh, internal luminal uh, diameter and the external luminal were selected. And the careful and uh, glue was are also selected because this would have a biocompatible uh, uh, thing and uh, carefully inserted into the implant and then sterilized with the E2O and uh, uh, then it was used in the human this one. And also RD biocompatibility, we did a lot of uh, test uh, uh, to uh, uh, find out the sterility of the uh, uh, implant and also uh, to compare the microbiological uh, profile, this, uh, the toxin, endotoxin level were also assessed and also the residual uh, E2O, it's ethylene oxide residual analysis are also uh, done with the, uh, in a laboratory in Indra in California. All were almost uh, equal to or less than that of a bare wells implant. And of course, we had done a study initially with 30, so 30 patients of complicated glaucomas. It's a failed trap and other uh, secondary glaucomas like following tuberculectomy. And the re result was so very uh, common. This uh, preoperative intraocular pressure as so 31, and at the end of two years, the intraocular pressure was about 13.58, uh, which is statistically very significant. And also, the number of medication also from 2.6 to uh, one at the end of uh, 24 years, and visual acuity remains same. So, so uh, 618 at the end of two years, it remains same in most of the cases. But we had, of course, initial uh, learning period, we had some complications like a CD and uh, tube retraction, and uh, also the blockage with the uh, iris was easily managed, except for uh, two cases which we are not able to uh, save these eyes. These are some of the things, and also it's a C marked now, and. Uh, of course, uh, I'm very happy that Arab was very uh, 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 forward in uh, making uh, this implant with us for more than two years. And finally, we have come up with a very good, uh, uh, very well accepted implant, especially a uh, leading institute in India and other countries. And uh, it's now it's one of the best uh, uh, implant available, uh, especially in developing countries, uh, especially in managing the intractable glaucoma. Thank you very much.
next speaker <coughs> next speaker is our uh, moderator the dr nelly Bigi, and he'll talk about the innovations in the world so that would be nice to learn see what's going on yeah thank you sir <coughs> uh, we've been uh, hearing about all the innovations that's been going on in a country i thought it appropriate that in brief i should even sum up what's going on all over the world quite a few of them especially the surgery based one you might also have heard about it but i'll try to divide this talk into those which are going on in medical and surgical scene and other areas so in the medical management uh, basically we have a couple of uh, new drugs coming up. Of course, there are plenty of drugs. I have uh, tried to cut short those which are probably having a lot of promise for the future. One of them is the topical row kinase inhibitor or rock inhibitors. And uh, the advantage or the big here, use here is that this drug is likely to remain or is going to remain localized to the anterior chamber with very minimal side effects all over the body. Now there is uh, one which has a much bigger promise, which is a combination of a rock inhibitor with norepinephrine. And uh, this has a potentiating effect and it is supposed to bring down a normotensive patient intraocular pressure by roughly about 30%, which is like quite significant. And the uh, studies here are ongoing and then we can expect that these drugs should be released in the, the coming future. Then the other things that we have apart from uh, the direct drugs which are instilled are the implants. Now, plenty of areas we can instill or implant the drugs right from conjunctiva to juxtascleal and suprascoroidal spaces. One of the promising things that's coming up is the brimonidin microspherules, which are implanted subconjunctivally. So these are microspherules like this, which have the drug which is within that, and once they're implanted, they slowly release the drugs after the dissolution of the outer membrane of the polylactic acid. So here, the immediate reduction of intraocular pressure of roughly about 20 millimeter, which has been sustained for roughly about 55 days in mice has been proved, and human trials are here are on. And if we can have this, this is like really a very nice adjuvant where we can keep uh, uh, putting the drug subconjunctively uh, roughly about every two months. We have uh, Travoprost oculotherapeutics, which are punct basically punctal plugs, which are injected into the punctum here and then kept, and then the drug is implanted within this, and then over a period of time, this slowly eludes the drug. So these are like the drug eluting stents which are put in cardiology. So next we have some stem cell innovations, which are the big thing now, the pluripotent stem cells, which can be transformed into any of the subcategories like neural cells or cardiac muscles. Basically, pluripotent stem cells are the blastocysts which are taken out and then cultured undifferentiated cells. So these undifferentiated cells later can be designed to get differentiated into the tissue that we want. So these pluripotent cells can be grown to differentiate into specialized cells and the advantage is they don't face rejection because they're already the exact genetic match. Now a dermatologic uh, uh, skin or the skin cells are taken and then these are uh, uh, differentiated into retinal ganglion cells and trabecular meshwork cells. And uh, these research, the research into this is very, very actively going on into an, in an advanced phase. So the advantages uh, here of such cells is that this can be used in drug research. You can take these cells and do all your drug research on that without having any ethical issues. But more importantly, these induced pluripotent cells, when you induce them into the tissue like whatever you require, then you can um, make new tissue. Like for example, the trabecular meshwork can be replaced to have a fresh trabecular meshwork and then you can have uh, a, a relatively good drainage. Now, one disadvantage here is that what they have observed in uh, Indiana University, when glaucoma patient skin cells turn into stem cells and then into retinal ganglion cells, the cells become unhealthy over a period of time and start dying off at a much faster rate than those of healthy individuals. That is, if you take it from the patient and then differentiate them, redifferentiate them back into the glang ganglion cells, they tend to die earlier than a tissue of a healthy patient. This can have a lot of implications which we need to see in the future. The challenges are that the stem cells must be safely implanted into the correct site within the eye, failing which there can be a problem. And in order to be functional, they must establish working connections with specific parts of the brain when it is the neural cells. And if it is trabecular meshwork with Schlem's canal and collector channels. Any stem cells implanted into a patient with glaucoma must remain stable for a significant period of time and not cause any serious side effects. 
we have innovations in surgical management. Mind you, I'm putting the very briefly the most important ones, whatever I can speak in uh, seven minutes. We have the MIGS or the micro-incision glaucoma surgeries and others. In MIGS, I'm just going to talk about eye stent and then the hydro stent. So the eye stent is a heparin-coated micro stent. Uh, it, is, it bypasses the trabecular meshwork and conducts the fluid from anterior chamber to all the way to the Schlem's canal. The results here showed that 72% of patients 12 months after the implant compared to 50% in the uh, control group had 20 millimeter mercury. Mind you, these studies are not very, very straightforward studies. If you see the results, you would know that you know it is not direct head-to-head -head comparison with the trabeculectomy for the simple reason that none of these devices match up to the trabeculectomy as of today. Maybe in future, but not as of today. Then you have the hydrous uh, micro stent. Uh, sorry, this is the eye stent uh, picture, which is implanted into the trabecular meshwork. And then this is the implantation device, and this is the size, actual size that you see. So uh, these typically are put up after a cataract surgery on the table after a phaco emulsification. Similarly, with hydrous micro stent, which is made, made of nitinol, which is an elastic nickel platinum alloy, it's about like uh, less than a centimeter long, and at three clock hours of the trabecular meshwork, it dilates up. So again, this does the same work, sending the aqueous to the Schlem's canal and collector channels and it has been developed by I.K. Ahmed at all. It looks something like that with three windows and then an entry point here. So the entry point juts out into the antechamber, something like that, and this dilates the Schlem's canal all the, the Schlem's canal all the way. So this lets in fluid, and then the fluid is supposed to percolate into the Schlem's canal and the trabecular meshwork, and this is where it sits. So the newer devices and uh, the materials, they're trying to work out different areas other than the conventional trabeculectomy, trying to uh, put it in into the choroid, suprachoroidal spaces or into the collector channels and spaces like that. The results show that uh, over a period of time, the washout mean diurnal intraocular pressure post cataract has been better than a plain cataract surgery alone. You can see the difference here. Again, if you notice, the comparison is with a plain cataract surgery and not again with a trabeculectomy. Uh, inspired by phaco emulsification, something known as deep wave trabeculoplasty has been evolved, and it is an external mechanical energy application with, which causes focal stretching and relaxation of the trabecular meshwork and activation of IL-1 and release of cytokines and reduction of the intraocular pressure. This is the machine, how it looks. It is just superimposed on the area of the trabecular meshwork, and then these deep waves are emitted causing the changes in the trabecular meshwork, like what happens in phaco emulsification, more so in a focused way, and then this is supposed to reduce the intraocular pressure. 30% revealed that deep wave trabecular plasty results in about 26% decrease in intraocular pressure. How long it gets sustained, we need to see, because the experience from phaco emulsification or sustainability over period is not very, very good. High intensity frequency ultrasound is another one which uses a transcleral outflow of aqueous humor and causes focal destruction of ciliary epithelium, resulting in intraocular pressure reduction. Scleral uh, scarring has the potential for separation of ciliary body from the sclera, enhance, further enhancing the uveoscleral flow. This is the coagulative necrosis of the ciliary epithelium, which happens and which is supposed to cause the reduction in the intraocular pressure. And this is how the device is kept. These are the areas from where the high intensity frequency waves are emitted, the six areas there, over a period of 360 degrees in the limbus. So this is a portable uh, device. In summary, innovations are happening at a rapid pace across all aspects. Usable technology or techniques need to make a good difference to the existing method, be cost-effective as well as easily usable. Newer methods need to stand the test of time as well as to replace to uh, replace the older established uh, technologies. So it is said that probably, as Steve Jobs says, the future innovations will be an integration of biology and technology into a large extent. Of course, the basic innovations, what we saw now, we had a lot of things which didn't involve any technology. But of course, probably in future, technology would also be stepping in in addition to make these innovations happen. Thank you. Well, our last speaker is Dr. Deepak Edward, who's professor of ophthalmology and pathology at Wilmer Eye. And I think, are you coming from college, say, from Saudi Arabia right now? Uh, yeah, I'm done, done with Saudi oh. now. I see you okay. back to the U.S. Well, we'll be hearing about molecular pathology of failed glaucoma shunts, clinical lessons. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, 
distinguished colleagues. Um, it's nice to be here and talk to you in an innovative innovation symposium and enjoyed all the talk. So what I will do today is uh, try to blend my two subspecialties of glaucoma and pathology to see what we can learn from failed glaucoma shunts and what clinical lessons these teach us. So we'll talk about the pathology of healing in glaucoma devices. I think Dr. Pandav has already uh, uh, given a good introduction to what I'm going to talk about. Look at the molecular pathology of the capsules of glaucoma drainage devices, potential targets of how you could uh, work on this, and some of the clinical lessons that uh, uh, can be derived from this, uh, this, uh, this talk. So uh, again, you know, glaucoma drainage devices are basically designed to uh, move fluid from the anterior chamber and shunt it to a glaucoma drainage plate. And the success in lowering intraocular pressure depends upon the capsule formation that provides optimal resistance to outflow while maintaining hydraulic conductivity. So you want some healing, some scarring to take place, otherwise your pressure would be zero. Now, the fluid mechanics across the uh, capsule wall, as Dr. Pandavid nicely pointed out, depends on the porosity of the uh, capsule and the scanning electron micrograph shown on your right from Don Minkler's study many years ago suggests that there's passive diffusion of fluid across the fibrous wall around the plate. So here's an eye, uh, a human eye, an unfortunate child with the medullary epithelioma who underwent uh, a shunt uh, device, so which you see here. And you can see the glaucoma drainage device and the, the, the shunt, uh, um, the, uh, the capsule forming around the shunt and also the tissue forming uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the holes uh, in this barbell shunt. So if you look at this uh, microscopically, you can see a nice uh, fibrotic wall around the, around the shunt, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So your success in glaucoma surgery, uh, uh, glaucoma shunt or drainage device surgery is really a balancing act. And... We have learned from many studies, uh, especially the Ahmed Barrel comparison study, that uh, over five years, uh, whether you put an Ahmed valve or a glaucoma uh, or a Barrel shunt, you have approximately a third of them, or you know, uh, they fail, or um, almost half of them fail. And the, fi the failure is dependent and related to again the fibrosis and what exactly happens in the fibrosis that changes the hydraulic uh, impermeability or permeability of the capsule. Now, if you look at the hydraulic uh, resistance of any uh, uh, organ, and people in the orthopedic literature has taught us a lot, and also the people in the CNS literature, it's influenced by the extracellular matrix that includes collagens and glycosaminoglycans. And Maltino in his studies showed that increased collagen 3 and 6 and apoptotic markers are the hallmarks of these uh, 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 failed glaucoma shunts. Also, we, uh, as we heard, uh, aqueous uh, cytokines, especially TGF-beta and interleukins, might be very important uh, in causing uh, 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 fibrosis, and you'll see more of that in a minute. So here's what we've been uh, uh, doing to study these, and this is sort of the uh, workflow where you take uh, uh, the excised capsules, do histology, but also look at uh, the capsules for gene expression, uh, immunize the chemistry and then draw uh, 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 pathway targets and identify molecular targets and eventually, hopefully, uh, get uh, agents which can modulate wound healing. So when you look at these failed devices, uh, uh, and the capsules, as you, those of you who excise it, are often very, very smooth and shiny in the inner surface. Histologically, you always see two zones. The inner surface, the valve is here, is very thick and compact, and the outer one, all the collagenous connective tissue is very loosely arranged. Now, if you look at gene expression on these excised uh, capsules, and we, we looked at this by using a fibrosis microarray and validated this by RT-PCR. This is sort of a, a heat map for gene expression that's been uh, generated. A very busy slide, but just wanted to point out to you that uh, the results of the slide show that wound modulation occurs many years after surgery. And also, you have very significant um, um, uh, pro-fibrotic and extracellular matrix remodeling genes expressed in the failed capsule uh, of, the, uh, of this. So if anybody's interested, can read it in PLOS One from last year. Now, we also wanted to validate and see exactly where some of these targets were expressed. And if you look at uh, a normal glaucoma valve, a functioning valve from Maltino studies, uh, uh, also shown very nicely by Dr. Pandav, the inner capsule tends to be very thin and more porous outside uh, the capsule. 
Uh, and if you look at the inner surface of the uh, glaucoma uh, fail valves, they're much more thicker. Now, again, lots of busy slides, uh, but basically to show we did immunohistochemistry, chemistry, and you see collagen 1 is lowered. Uh, collagen 3 goes up, as shown by Martino. We also found that there, the myofibroblasts uh, become much more, and this is a critical finding, uh, which uh, I'll tell you why in just a moment. And also, you, uh, you, you look at uh, cell proliferation markers, and of course, years afterwards, uh, they actually decrease with time, but uh, even though they decrease, uh, there is still activity going on. If you label the shunt with the uh, TGA beta antibodies, uh, the expression is increased, and so also with uh, keratin sulfate, which is a uh, glycosaminoglycan. So uh, in summary for this part is we have increased collagen-3, increased TGA beta, uh, increased extracellular matrix proteins, an increased number of myofibroblasts, and so how can we put all of this together uh, to, set, to make some sense out of this? So if you do a flow map, and uh, the first slide where you showed, uh, we showed, I showed you the RNA expression, these are all the molecules that went up and down. The, and basically what's happening in this wound healing, and this is nothing new, this has actually been described in the skin literature, TGF beta goes up and activates uh, the myofibroblast, uh, and this is the culprit. Because once a cell, a fibroblast, and a normal healing, they just proliferate, but if they do become myofibroblasts, the extracellular matrix becomes uh, deregulated, and that's why you see lowering of all these different types of uh, uh, extracellular matrix proteins, and that's what results in fibrosis. So the various targets here, uh, targets of TGF beta, how can you work on uh, myofibroblasts, and there are other targets here also, but when you are doing drug design or drug discovery, uh, getting the target as low away is much easier or way up in the, in the chain uh, is something that you can do. So what are the, some of the clinical lessons we know? So we know, uh, again, not just the studies we showed, but others from Friedman and others showed that TGA beta and profibrotic cytokines go up. Uh, many of you glaucoma specialists probably have uh, uh, read this nice study from Iran, uh, which basically did a randomized control study where they said, well, if cytokines are going up, we, can, we should be reducing aqueous production in these patients. And if you reduce aqueous production, TGA beta is coming from the, uh, in the aqueous humor, uh, that the shunts would function better. And so nicely enough that they, they showed that if they put these patients on Timolol immediately after surgery, these patients did much better. So the other possibility can be tie the tubes off and prevent uh, the, the aqueous from uh, uh, forming, uh, getting the, uh, more TGA beta in. The answer is yes and no, because uh, once you, uh, you have secondary aqueous coming, you really can't stop the TGA beta production. You know, it's a constant thing, but it's possible. How about using antibodies against uh, TGA beta? Uh, many of you uh, who are older enough in this audience probably remember the CAT-152 study uh, where they use a TGF beta antibody to try and prevent scarring in, in, in uh, trabeculectomies. It failed, and uh, the study didn't uh, reach its end point. Many reasons for that. How about myofibroblast inhibition uh, are causing, uh, having medications that uh, work on actin tubulin modulation? Again, those of you who've read Maltino studies, they're very highly successful, all his valves. And uh, the cocktail he uses with his, uh, for a post-op is colchicine, flumanophenic acid, and prednisone orally. So if you look at this uh, carefully and look at uh, agents that modulate uh, 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 microtubule or actin uh, uh, modifying agents. So if you use these agents, you can actually prevent the cell from going and becoming into myofibroblast. So I want you, want to, you to, uh, to draw your attention to these drugs. Uh, uh, colchicine, of course, is available on the market. And in my opinion, this is actually the magic uh, drug here, not the uh, anti-inflammatory prednisone. This is probably what is uh, helping uh, Maltino's uh, study succeed. Uh, lenticulin is another uh, medication which was supposed to be a glaucoma drug. It's no longer uh, being pursued. Again, another potential target because you have a to uh, way to, uh, topical medication. And people have looked at Taxol, which is uh, used in breast cancer, uh, but uh, have also tried it in glaucoma surgery and found that to be fairly uh, uh, useful in an experimental model. So in conclusion, in a wound healing following glaucoma, shunt surgery is complex. Many classes of genes and proteins are uh, upregulated. Uh, TGF beta-related pathways are important. And then you can use molecular pathology uh, to identify pathways and also potential targets for wound modulation. Thank you very much.
Can I request all the speakers to please come so that we can have a discussion? Sir, Ramakrishna, sir. While you are taking your seats, uh, can I start a question uh, from Dr. Edwards? I mean, it's a very nice analysis how these blabs fail, but uh, looking at practicality for all our clinicians, would you want to use colchicine and prednisolone as an oral use in a routine post-op patient uh, with a failing blab in a in a tube? Um, you bring up a very good point. These are fairly uh, uh, drugs that have a lot of uh, toxic effects. Um, I think the point here is to look at, uh, you know, there's a cocktail, and uh, which of these cocktails, uh, the drugs of, of these cocktails is the most effective. I think in order to do that, uh, the first, I guess, uh, you have potential targets. I'm not advocating that we use all of these, uh, but look at it, and I think at some point, uh, uh, for example, colchicine is actually available as a topical ointment in Australia, uh, but it's a skin ointment. Uh, so I think uh, agents such as these need to be looked at in the future to see how we can uh, modulate or modify myofibroblast function. There are drugs available. Uh, again, uh, uh, preferably a drug that's already approved, but you're using an off-label use is usually e useful. So I think, it, you know, something like colchicine might be helping in some patients, but that is to be seen. Well, let's ask somebody else. Uh, anyone who wants to, how do they take care of the failing blab in a tube? Uh, I think this this area, uh, I think there are a lot of uncertainties here, and some of the understanding we have just started to get. I think uh, Dr. Deepak, uh, Deepak Edward uh, mentioned about the fibroblast. I think that's that's quite important, and that also happens in trabeculectomy also. Um, the clinically, what we do is, I think uh, uh, the ER work suggests that uh, you know it's kind of aqueous cytokines that was believed, and also the you know cytokines which are locally produced, they somehow induce fibroblast proliferation and also conversion of fibroblast to myofibroblast, and which actually uh, makes the thick scar. So somehow, if you can interrupt somewhere in this path, you know where to intervene, we don't really know. But ER data suggests that other than cytokines. Uh, I think the, the pressure model also works, and that we have also seen clinically, that if you have a high hydrostatic pressure, that can induce fibroblasts to proliferate and also convert into myofibroblasts. So I think that is also one of the stimulus uh, which acts to, uh, you know, increase the number and, you know, type of the fibroblasts in the tissue. So in the early post-operative period, if you are keeping your pressures low, uh, you know, by giving uh, equisuppressants, even after a tube surgery, I think clinically also we have seen that these patients, they have less hypertensive phase uh, in the post-op period. The long-term outcome may not be very different, but early, you know, the immediate post-op period certainly is much better if you're giving uh, uh, hypotense, equiseprins, uh, you know, early in the phase. So that means there is some relationship between, uh, you know, reducing the pressure, reducing the hydrostatic stress on the fibroblast and the ultimate outcome. So, so I think that's one of the things that we uh, kind of do to have a little better success of our implants. Dr. Siota. Um Having worked in retina, and I think a lot of people who've seen uh, retinal buckles, uh, I think they, there's no aqueous there, there's nothing else over there, but they have these lovely smooth capsules as well. So what about the uh, material itself? Is, is there something that we could put on the surface or elude over, elude over time to say that, you know, that uh, interaction between the foreign body and the tissue could be dampened to some extent because obviously there's no aqueous in a retinal sort of buckle, but the same kind of capsule occurs there as well. Actually, in our work, when we put the implant and we didn't connect it with any fluid, it was like a retinal buckle. You have a very nice thin capsule over it, but the moment you connect to a fluid, aqueous or BSS, it changes its character. Uh, let me just summarize. I just want to say one thing. At Columbia, we have developed a protocol how we take care of these post-op. This is true that this is more common with the amyloid implants as compared to Barwell's, and cytokines, as he said, Jeff Friedman is the one who has pioneered work. Our goal is that we see the patient on a weekly basis. Whenever the pressure starts to go higher than 14, uh, which happens within two or three weeks, we give them those suppressants, like what we talked about, beta blocker, or it could be COSOPT. And if the pressure still goes up, we have seen that in the old time also, if you needle the bleb 
the pressure comes down because after all it is externalization of the anterior chamber, the pressure in the anterior chamber is same as in the blab. So just a needle, needling the blab, this has to be done more often. But what I have started to do is needle and inject 5-FU. And more than that, the fibrosis doesn't happen on the plate, as we all know. It is beyond the plate. That's where the cyst starts to form. So if with the same needle, if you can go and some, somehow the other erase that fibrous tissue or break that fibrous tissue, done a couple of times, I find a success rate to be very high. Anyone else wants to say about that? Couple of months now. Uh, yeah, of when course, we... uh, uh, I agree with uh, Bansal. Uh, we have, uh, instead of IFU, uh, we have started using mitromycin injection also. Mitromycin in a very low concentration of 0.02% with, uh, mixed with the equal amount of uh, lignocaine, much more posteriorly. Uh, we used to inject and then uh, do a nearly. Uh, that also gives a very good result when compared to initially we were trying uh, five of you, but uh, we are not happy. But uh, my automation looks better. Yeah. Okay. One last question. GC sir, uh, I want to ask. So you once you take the photograph for the superimposition, we need to have. Uh, suppose we want to make a 3D photograph. 3D photographs have to be taken at the time of taking the photograph. So you have to have an Allen separator or whatever it is, slightly separate and take two photographs. Only then you get a 3D. Would, with this uh, camera the of yours, later on, if work, you use a separate no, no, no. software... Planimetry would work even with a 2D photograph. For doing the standardization of the population-based study, this thing, we have taken 3D photographs and on them outlined the disc and cup margins viewing with a 3D. So how accurately can you mark the cup is what with, without a 3D is a limitation. Whether you go by the color, whether you go by the contour, how well can you make out the contour without a 3D view is a point. Okay, we'll need to close probably next session. Yes, thank you very much. I thank the panel and the audience. Yes.